Hello! It's time to get started on the second paper, and this brief video is just going to hit some of the most important points about the second paper assignment. You'll be working more independently, so it's very, very important that you study the assignment sheet um, that is linked to this week. You will be able pretty much to choose your own topic, but there are some topics you can't write on, and those are listed on the assignment sheet. So make sure that you look at those and study all of the details on the assignment sheet, because I'm not going to go over everything in this video. As I said, you may write in a topic of your choosing, except for some of those that are listed. Um, and you may not write on the same topic that you wrote on for paper one. This is supposed to be a brand new paper. Okay? And the reason that we're working more independently is because this class is actually designed to teach you to write papers for other classes. And the test of whether you can do that or not is to see whether you can do it um, without someone else necessarily taking you through step by step and telling you exactly what you need to do. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't ask me. You certainly may email me at any point and ask me anything you want about any aspect of the paper, whether it's topic or finding sources or how to use the sources or how to organize the paper or how to use MLA, anything at all. I am always here for you, and you may always email me, just the same as you did on the first paper. That doesn't change. What does change is that you're not going to have as many weekly deadlines to meet, so you'll be able to work a little bit more independently in terms of time. You do have to select an appropriate audience for your paper. The audience has to be, just as it was for, four, um, for paper one, professors, graduate students, and upper-level undergraduate students. In other words, it is going to be an academic audience that has background and is informed in the discipline you're addressing, but not necessarily on your topic. You have to choose an academic discipline that's appropriate to your topic. Now, as you'll read in the assignment sheet, there are very few topics that you can't address for some ac academic discipline. Um, I know a professor who recently presented a paper at a popular culture conference on soap operas. But as you'll note, because it says so in the assignment sheet, it took her over a year to do that. To, to, to do the research on it because there aren't very many, there aren't any sources. She had to actually call um, or email and um, interview soap actors and soap writers and soap directors, which is something that you're not going to be able to do. Okay. Um, but certainly popular culture topics can be addressed to various disciplines. One thing, though, that you should keep in mind is that the more current and more recent a topic is, the more difficult it's going to be for you to find acceptable sources on it, because you still can't use websites. Um, for example, I teach a class in horror literature. Now, I can find all kinds of sources on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, because people have been writing about it since the 1800s, and a lot has been written. On the other hand, if I wanted to teach one of the more recent novels, particularly um, from Stephen King, I would have a hard time finding academic sources that have written anything about it. Uh, for one thing, it takes over a year to get anything published in academic journals. Um, and for another, there simply isn't as much written about popular culture because 
it's not a very large portion of academic study. Uh, it, it is a portion of it. And for example, I know a guy who wrote a paper on um, the uh, on how oxygen would be delivered using the co the copper in Vulcan blood as opposed to the iron in human blood. Okay, so you will find papers on things like that, but they're a lot harder to find than some of the more classic traditional types of topics that you might expect. So make sure that you do your initial research and that you know that the sources are out there to support your writing a paper before you choose a topic. Um, some examples of academic disciplines, I'm sure most of you know this, but in case you don't, it's pretty much any department in a college that offers classes. So psychology, history, art, music, English, Spanish, chemistry, astronomy, biology, nursing, cultural studies, law, political science, um, uh, dental hygiene, um, x-ray technology, phlebotomy, you name it. If there's a class in it, it's an academic discipline. Um, there aren't too many things that wouldn't be appropriate for an academic discipline. I mean, you know, even gardening would be appropriate for horticulture or cooking obviously would be appropriate for the culinary arts. So it's hard to come up with something that there isn't an appropriate discipline for, but you have to choose which discipline would be interested in and knowledgeable in the topic that you're writing on. Here are some the general requirements for the paper. It has to be five to seven pages long plus the work cited page, just like paper one was. You have to use a minimum of five sources, just as you did for paper one, and in a few minutes we're going to talk about what those sources have to be. The paper has to be objective and informative, not persuasive. We don't do persuasive writing in this class. So if you're writing about a controversial topic, you can't take a side. Now, it is appropriate, for example, to write a, a paper that just presents what either the supporters or critics on an issue state. But you have to make it very clear that you are presenting just the supporters' view or just the critics' view, and you're not necessarily saying they're right, because you're not going to make us to take a stand on it. Um, and if you choose to do that, and I don't necessarily recommend doing it because it's a little tricky, you will definitely want to get in touch with me about the organization and the wording. The paper must be written in a formal academic style. No first-person pronouns like I, we, me, us, those. No second-person pronouns like you and yours. No contractions, um, except, of course, indirect quotes. And those should be very, very rare, as we discussed in working on the first paper. You also need to avoid phrases like I think, I believe, um, uh, um, I agree, um, it seems to me, anything like that. Avoid that. Remember, in academics, nobody cares about what we think. They only care about what we can support with data. The paper has to be formatted in MLA style and submitted in Microsoft Word. You have to use MLA in-text citations and um, put together a correct works cited page that uses um, correct MLA works cited entries. And you want to use summary and paraphrase throughout your paper and avoid inappropriate use of direct quotes. And we learned what those are when we were working on the first paper and um, you'll be able to review it for the second paper. You have to use acceptable sources, and again, it's the same list as it was for the first paper. As I already said, you need a minimum of five sources. They're the same as they were for paper one. You can use any print source, 
any newspaper, magazine, academic journal, book, anything like that, because it's been through the editing process. The only thing that is an exception to that is you should avoid general encyclopedias like World Book or Encyclopedia Britannica or anything like that because they're too simplistic for college level writing. But you may use specialized encyclopedias such as the um, Encyclopedia of Popular Culture or um, the Encyclopedia of um, Contemporary Literature or um, a Medical Encyclopedia or a Legal Encyclopedia. Anything like that is fine. But a general encyclopedia like Britannica or Encarta or World Book, that's just too simplistic for writing papers really beyond the 7th or 8th grade and certainly too simplistic for college. You may use, of course, anything that you download through the CSN library databases. Um, that includes, of course, um, articles, uh, ebooks, um, documentaries, and films. Anything that comes from the library database is fine. Um, for that matter, you can use most documentaries, but you have to be a little bit careful about documentaries because some of them are produced by very reputable. Um, organizations, uh, the History Channel, um, Arts and Entertainment, Biography, Discovery, um, Nova, Scientific America, uh, anything like that is fairly reputable. But some documentaries um, are put together by people whose backgrounds are somewhat questionable. I watch a lot of documentaries on the Kennedy assassination and the various conspiracy theories just out of personal interest. It's kind of a hobby of mine. And some of them are, are very, very good and they come from very reputable sources and some of them are kind of out there. Okay, so um, while they're interesting, I wouldn't necessarily use them as a source in an academic paper. Okay, so documentaries are by and large okay. If you have any question about it, do email me and give me some information about the documentary and I'll tell you whether it's a good source or not. Okay, but of course if it's something that you find through the CSN library database, it's definitely good. Um, as are, of course, all the articles that you can download from the databases. You have to use at least one book again. And, of course, it can be an anthology. If you use an anthology, which you should know by now, is a book that has different chapters written by different people. Each chapter that's written by a different person is considered a separate source. So anthologies are, are really good sources to use. Um, and definitely that would count as a book. And yes, I can tell it's a book. As you know by now, I can tell it's a book by the way that the um, works cited entry is set up, right? Because a, a work from an anthology is um, cited a particular way on the works cited page. So I'll be able to tell. Don't worry about that. Okay? But you do have to use at least one book. And again, you can't use any general websites. You can't use any .com, .net, .org, or .edu websites or sources without sending me the link to the source so that I can check it out and you have to get my approval to use it. Some of them are fine and some of them aren't. It depends on who produces them and rather than have you have to learn how to make that determination, which you'll learn in 102, um, it's easier for you to just send me the link if you, if you think a website is okay and I'll let you know whether it is or not. You may, of course, use .gov websites and the Statistical Abstract of the United States is always a good source. And once again, don't use any personal experiences or personal opinions. This is an academic paper written to upper level students who are undergraduates, to graduate students, and to professors. And personal experience and personal opinion, unless a professor 
specifically asks you to include that really isn't um, acceptable for most academic papers. You need to use appropriate organization for your paper, and the organization is going to vary depending on your topic, actually. For a lot of papers, it will just be simple emphatic order. But if you're writing a biography of a person, or you're writing about the history of how something happens, um, you're going to use chronological order, which is different. If you're uh, writing about Oh, let's say, for example, um, the different layers of the Earth's crust. You're going to be using spatial organization, which is different. Um, if you're writing about um, an illness, type 2 diabetes or um, schizophrenia, and if you're writing about it and addressing it to, say, a nursing discipline. So you're going to be talking about the um, causes, symptoms, um, treatment, and prognosis. Well, that's organized differently, too. That's not emphatic order either. Um, and I will be doing short videos on each of the different types of organization and, and how to go about doing them. Um, and presenting those in the weeks to come. You have to choose and adhere to the organi organizational guidelines that are appropriate for your topic and audience. Um, the informative, pardon me, I'm stumbling all over today. The informative paper checklist, which um, there is a link to on this week's um, assignment page, gives an overview of the different organizational schemes that are appropriate for various topics. So you should probably go ahead and look at the organization section um, of the informative paper checklist um, right now uh, to make sure that you have at least some idea of how you're going to be organizing your paper because that might have some influence on your research process. Okay, here are just some general tips about writing this paper. Except for the initial research source form, which is due on a particular date, um, and the scratch outline that you have to turn in, there aren't any intermediate deadlines for this paper. There's not as much of a chance that more than one student's going to be writing on the same topic, so it wouldn't really be helpful to anybody to have you post summaries. And frankly, I'm going to assume that by now you know how to annotate sources and how to, to find information from sources. And if you don't, then you need to definitely review how to do that, because it's important that you know how to do that. So you'll You'll be turning in an initial research source form, and you'll be turning in a scratch outline, and that's all you'll be turning in until the final paper. I do encourage you to send me drafts of the paper, and I definitely encourage you to email me with questions as often as you, ha as often as you have them. There aren't going to be any quizzes while you're working on this second paper. We've already covered the grammar, and... Uh, we're not really going to be doing anything all that new except for learning different organizational patterns. Um, so there are no quizzes at all. You can work more at your own pace. I have set up a weekly assignment schedule, and it would be in your own best interest to adhere to it. Uh, because I think that you'll find that if you don't, you're, what you're going to end up doing is procrastinating and putting this second, the work on this second paper off until just before it's due, because we all tend to do that. Um, that's just human. It's not because you're a student. It's not because you're lazy. That's just human nature. I do the same thing. I don't know anybody who doesn't. But if you stick to that weekly assignment schedule, you're going to find that your life is a lot less stressful, particularly at the end of the semester. Your paper is going to be better. You're going to be able to get more help from 
the reference librarian, from the writing center, from tutors that you work with, and definitely from me, than if you wait till the last minute to do anything. So I definitely recommend that you stick to the weekly assignment pages schedules um, as they're posted. But you do have more leeway in terms of how you use your time. The links to the videos that we studied for paper one will be posted on those weekly assignment pages for paper two. So you don't have to go back and look for the videos. If you stick to the assignment schedule, um, what you need to review pretty much in the order you need to review it, the links for those videos will appear just as they did when you were writing the first paper. And hopefully by now you know that the way that works is that it will say, for example, study the video on writing a working claim. And right underneath that, you'll see a box that is probably some kind of a color and has an arrow in the middle of it. And all you have to do is click on that arrow to launch the video. And then in the lower right corner, it's a YouTube video. You know how to work with YouTube videos. In the lower right corner, you'll see a little box. And if you double click on that, it will make it full screen. And then to get out of full screen, you just hit the escape key. It's just like any other YouTube video. Okay. So the links will be posted um, on the weekly assignment pages. Uh, you don't have to go back and, and look for them, except, of course, for things about grammar and so forth. Um, you don't have to go back and to the paper one pages to look for the, the videos. I'll post those for you. The only videos that will be new and different, as I said, will be those on organization. Because how you organize your paper is going to depend on your topic, and I am going to do very brief videos on each of the organizational styles. Now, I recommend that you study and take notes on all of the organizational styles because at some point while you're in college, you will probably use every one of them. And nobody is ever going to teach you how to do it again. So I do recommend that, that you view and take notes on all of them. But you particularly have to study the video on the organizational scheme that is appropriate for your paper. Because if you don't, your paper won't be organized correctly, and that will definitely have a pretty bad effect on your grade. I strongly recommend that you stick to the assignment schedule, that you review the videos that are presented, um, and particularly for that you review the videos um, about aspects of the paper that um, you didn't do as well on in paper one. Um, if you do, we're going to find this paper a lot less stressful, a lot easier to write, and you'll end up doing a much better job and therefore earning a much higher grade. And remember, this paper is worth 40% of your grade. It's worth as much as the first paper was. So it's very important that you do a really good job on this. But that's going to mean that you have to take responsibility for setting your own intermediate deadlines, for asking me questions if you need help. In other words, it's going to be exactly the same as it would be if you were assigned a paper in any class. You're given the assignment. You're given the parameters of the assignment. Um, you have a couple of intermediate deadlines to meet. And other than that, you work pretty much on your own. And that's how it's going to be in other classes. And so I want you to get some practice in doing it that way, which is why this paper is set up with more flexibility. Um, I want you to be able to, to have, to, to, to be able to, I part, sorry me. I want you to be able to work out a schedule and see what it takes to write a paper over a given period of time, working more independently, and always remembering that you can ask me for help at any time. You can always ask any professor for help on a paper. Professors are always more than happy to help you, but you have to ask. 
we're not your mom, and we're not going to come and ask you, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? No. If you need help, all you have to do is email me. I'm just an email away, and I'll be happy to help you. But you have to take the initiative in asking for help. With that in mind, staying in touch with me and submitting drafts and submitting them early will definitely be to your advantage. No, I'm not going to require them. But if you send in at least one draft for me to comment on before the paper is due, you're going to get a lot of help in improving your paper, just as you did when you turned in the drafts for paper one. You don't have to turn in any drafts until the final version. And it's important to keep in mind that the earlier you send me drafts, the better it's going to be. Because I can only work at the most 16 hours a day and have enough energy in my brain to do anything like a decent job. And people who wait until the last minute, if I get 40 to 42 drafts the day before the paper's due, I'm not going to be able to read those. It's just not humanly possible. So the sooner you can send me drafts, the better. I do encourage you to do it. By all means, ask me questions. That's what I'm here for. I am here for you just as much as I was when you were working on paper one. I'm just not requiring the intermediate deadlines because I want you to practice working more independently. That's what you're going to be expected to do whenever you take a paper that requires a, a research paper. And 101, which you will get credit for if you pass this class, 101 is the prerequisite for a number of courses, uh, both in the English department and in other disciplines. Uh, that require term papers. And so you're going to be expected to write papers pretty much on your own and to seek help when you need it and not, ex not have somebody work with you on writing the paper unless you ask for the help. So that's what I'm giving you an opportunity to, to learn how to do. Do spend as much time on this paper as you did on paper one. Don't blow this off. It's worth 40% of your grade. And no matter how well you did on the first paper, if you don't earn a passing grade on this paper, you probably won't pass this class. And that would be a real shame considering how much work you put into it. So stay in touch with me. Work steadily on the paper. Let me help you any way I can. And of course, you know, if you have any questions about anything, if you want to send me a draft, if you want to change topics, if, if I can help you any way at all, all you have to do is send me an email at deborah.oki at csn.edu. And of course, you have to send it from an account other than Canvas. Okay, I hope that this helps you get started on the second paper. Make sure, make absolutely sure that you study that paper to assignment sheet because I didn't go over everything. I didn't go over the list of topics you can't write on and I absolutely will not accept any papers on those topics. So make sure that you study that, pa that assignment sheet. Okay, have a good day. Hope you have some time to enjoy yourself today.